But if a patient comes to the hospital, you have the patient in the clinic, the patient continues to smoke and comes to the hospital with an acute exacerbation of COPD, right? How are you going to treat them? Steroids. Okay, good. So if it's an acute exacerbation of COPD, you're going to give steroids. What is your choice of steroid? Prednisone. Do you want to give PO or do you want to give IV? PO is fine. Is it equally effective as IV? Yes, it actually is. So you don't have to pick IV just because you think the patient is sicker. It doesn't work like that. PO is equally effective as IV. So when would you pick IV? If the patient cannot take it by mouth, then you will give them IV. Say the patient is very sick that maybe need to be intubated or maybe they had to be put on a BiPAP. Then you will give them IV. But if not, PO is good enough. Apart from that, what else are you going to give for an acute exacerbation? Huh? You're going to give breathing treatment which is typically going to revolve around a short acting beta agonist and a short acting and a uh, uh, short acting uh, Sama, right? So albutrol and aprotropium bromide is what you're going to be using, right? How often are you going to do that? You can do every four hours. Sometimes you can do it for an hour long even. It doesn't matter. Okay, there's no strict guidelines as to how much you're going to give. Treat the patient as it's needed, right? Now, do we have a dose limit on how much you want to give when you're giving prednisone, PO? 40. Typically, you stay around 40, you never go above 60. Okay, you typically stay around 40, never go above 60. What about IV? Is it 40 when you're doing solid metal? Is it 40 Q8? Is it Q12? Is it Q6? It doesn't matter. There's no hard and fast rule. Pick as you like. Okay? You can do whatever you want when it comes to solid metal, but the most important philosophy of steroids is give less, the least that you need for the shortest time. Make sense? Okay. Big question is for the boards, it's gonna be when would you give your patient with acute COPD exacerbation antibiotics? What is the indication? Suspected pneumonia. So you get a chest x ray in your COPD patient because you're always looking for an exciting event. Could they have a pneumonia? Could they have some infection that's present in the lungs? Say the chest x ray is completely clear. Crystal clear, okay? They no signs of infection. They have to make the three cardinal. Two, two Very good. Three. So it's two out of three criteria that you're going to use to give them antibodies. What are the two out of three criteria? Increase dyspnea. Increase uh, dyspnea, shortness of breath. Cough. Worsening cough and worsen or more production than usual. So it's increased sputum volume Purum. and increased sputum purulence. So those are the two important ones. Increased sputum volume and increased sputum purulence in the presence of dyspnea. So two out of three will qualify you for antibiotics. Now what antibiotic are you typically going to get? So typically you can use a macrolide or a doxycycline. Okay. But if the patient has any comorbid illness, if the patient is older, got diabetes, got CHF, got CKD, you must add a beta lactam to your macrolide or your doxycycline. Okay. So you can use ceftriaxone plus a doxy or an azithromycin or a you don't have to go for any pseudomonal coverage or MRSA coverage straight off the bat unless there was a specific indication for it. But when you should start the patient on antibiotics should be a question for the boards. Okay? All right. Now, what else are we going to do when somebody's got COPD in the hospital when they come in? Apart from giving steroids, breathing treatments and antibiotics, are we going to put them on oxygen? Yeah, they're going to put them on oxygen because most of them are going to be hypoxic, for instance, say. What is your oxygen target? Maybe short term or long term. What is your target you want to hit? What is the magic number? You want to hit 100? 88 is good enough. Okay. We do not need 90. We don't need 92. We don't need 100. 88 is your number. Keep it above 88 and you're happy. Okay. Now, when would you do an ABG on your patients? Does all your patients who come to the hospital require an ABG with COPD exhibition? When would you do it though in, in, in a clinical if setting? If you're suspecting the patient to be hypercarbic, if they're retaining CO2, then you would consider doing your ABG, right? So what would tell you the patient is probably hypercarbic? Yes, they will be more altered, more somnolent, right? More of when you have those features, then you think, okay, the patient could be uh, retaining CO2. So let's get an ABG to see what's going on. What if the patient wasn't like that? Would a first time COPD patient still warrant an ABG? Yes, it would still warrant an ABG. Why? 
CO2? You want to see how much, if they're retaining CO2 or not. Because the tendency is for most COPD patients is to retain CO2. So if they do retain CO2, what are you planning for? When they leave the hospital, would they benefit from some form of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation when they sleep? Yes. For that reason, you want to do. Another important sign on your chemistry is what to indicate that the patient most likely is a CO2 retainer. Bicarb. If your bicarb is actually elevated on the chemistry, that means you have contracted you have the alkalosis component present because the patient is most likely acidotic on the chronicity. Okay? So that's going to be important and therefore you have to get an ABG not just in your patient who is looking very sick. If it's a first time COPD patient, you can still get an ABG to see if they are re retaining CO2 to see if they are qualified for a bypass. And most patients who develop CO2 retention, would you pick a CPAP or a BiPAP? A BiPAP. You will pick a BiPAP. Why? Because you want to keep the airway open so they can blow on. Sure, because when you look at CPAP, it's a continuous positive airway pressure. Okay, so if the air is constantly blowing into your lungs, it will be much difficult for you to push stuff out. When you have a BiPAP, you have two settings, it's inspiratory pressure and expiratory pressure. So it gives time for you to actually wash it out. So whenever you want to wash CO2 out, you actually prefer a BiPAP. In fact, could a CPAP make it worse? Yes, because now you're making it harder for the patient to actually blow it out. So when it comes to COPD, it is always going to be BiPAP. The one place where you'll actually pick CPAP is going to be obstructive sleep apnea. Okay, so is it? And what is another reason we do an ABG in a patient with acute COPD exacerbation? So what is your treatment when it comes to COPD? When you're in goal stage A, which is the most basic stage, right? What do you want to put them on? Bronchodilators. So I like to remember A as alone. You will use just one drug. And typically the drug you're going to use is short acting beta agonist. What are your SABAs? Albutrol. Leave albutrol, perbetrol, okay? So those are gonna be your SABA, okay? So basically when somebody's got COPD early stage, all you're gonna be using is a short acting beta agonist, that's it, okay? What about B? B for both, okay? B for both. So what you're gonna do here, you're gonna combine a llama and a slava. got it? A lama and a lama. What are the lamas we know of? Ipratropium, which is your short acting. Now your long acting is going to be Teotropium. What else do we know? There are some newer drugs now, which is Aclidinium, Umiclidinium, and Glycopium. Perolate or glycoperonium. Okay, so it's aclidinium, omiclidinium, and glycoperonium. Okay. What about lavas? What drugs do we know? Vitrol. What's that? Is it vitrol or something? Salmeterol. Okay, formeterol. A formeterol. Very good. Vilanterol. What else? Olodactyrol and indactyrol. Okay? So these are going to be your labas. Salmetrol, formetrol, aformetrol, indactyrol, olodactyrol, and villentrol. So typically you're going to use a combination therapy when it comes to lama and lava. Is it better for you to use a single agent or is it better to use a combined agent? It's better to use a combined agent. Is it better to give both drugs in one inhaler or separately? Together. It's better to give them one inhaler. Is always going to be preferred. Okay, so it's pretty straightforward. What about E? So E, obviously you're going to use the same lama plus lava. But what is going to be different when it comes to E? E stands for eosinophils. E stands for eosinophils so you're going to look at your patient with what the eosinophil count is going to be if it is greater than 300 okay if your eosinophil count is greater than 300 traditionally COPD is not like asthma we all agree right it is not an allergic reaction 
but there is some component now that they've understood that there is some overlap and there is some form of eosinophilic involvement even in COPD. So the patients who actually have elevated eosinophil will respond to what drug? ICS, inhaled corticosteroids such as fluticasone, pyrocinide, okay? So when it comes to stage E, if you have elevated eosinophils, then you're going to add ICS to it. Not if you don't, if you do not have elevated eosinophil, then you do not add inhalational corticosteroids. Got it? Everyone makes sense of that question? Yes? Okay. So treatment wise, when it comes to COPD, on the chronicity is pretty straightforward. This is what you're going to do. All right. What else are we going to do? What actually has mortality benefit in a patient with COPD? Oxygen. Huh? Oxygen. You need to give patients oxygen. So when would you give a patient oxygen when you have COPD? What is the indication? 88. So oxygen saturation, if it is less than 88%, then you're going to give them oxygen. What else? PaO2 on your ABG, which is going to be less than? What's the number? 55. So less than 88 on your oxygen saturation, PaO2 less than 55 is your indication for oxygen. When would you have to give oxygen at a higher number? Because if you just have hypoxia right now, it's fine. But what if the hypoxia has been prolonged for such a long time that now you're developing some complications? Such as what? When would you give it at less than 89? And when would you give it at less than a PaO2 at 59? Okay? Oxygen saturation at 89 and PO2 at 59. So much higher level, so much more earlier that you're going to actually give them oxygen. What are your indications? Imagine if you were hypoxic for a long time. What's going to happen to your hemoglobin? It's going to go up. So erythrocytosis. Erythrocytosis is going to happen. Okay. If you have COPD for a long time, is your heart going to have a hard time pushing blood into your right from the right side into your lungs? Yes, so what's going to happen as a result? You're going to develop right-sided heart failure, right? Which is called, if you develop right-sided heart failure due to a lung problem, that is called core pulmonel, right? So core pulmonel, and what's the third one? 